Hello Biggies and welcome to the third edition of our Beer Geek Blind Taste Test in which I take on the best and the worst macro beers in the world in a blind taste test to the death. I've just finished my American Regional Brewery Taste Test and I'm chowing down on my new favourite American macro beer. Not as sense as I thought I'd say, but you can find out which one of these mm, beauties it is and indeed which of them came up last. Coming up on the Craft Beer Channel. So I've just finished the blind taste test, which means that before we get stuck in, we need a rewind. It smells like really watered down synthetic lemonade. Mm. It smells a bit gnarly, that. Like licking a postage stamp. Nice aroma, decent enough palate, nothing going on at the end. If you'd handed that to me and said that that was a, a small batch light lager with some kind of interesting hop in there, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Very cardboardy. That is like chewing on wet cardboard. Peas and banana. That's odd. Hello. Is there any aroma in that? Let's look for the top scorer and the bottom scorer. So the top scorer was... Okay, Big Geeks, we are back at the start of this blind taste test. And this blind taste test is more blind than any other blind taste test that I've ever done. If you haven't seen the first two that I did with macro beers, you can watch them. Uh, <laughs> I'll learn what side this is one day. I think it's that side. Uh, and in that I tasted what I consider terrible macro beer uh, and had some surprises there. And then I tasted what I consider good macro beer and had some surprises there as well. This one is different. I am going to know roughly what I'm going to be drinking, but I have never drunk any of these before, which I do need to qualify. I have had Budweiser, I have had Pabs, I have had Yingling. The rest are new to me, even Bud Light and Coors Light. They came to the UK long after I'd gone on the sort of the craft journey. So I've never had these before, and these are all American brewed as well. So the ones that I have had have come from an entirely different place to the Northampton or Burton or wherever it is that they, they're brewed for the UK market. So these are all going to be new to me. They're going to be uh, given to me blind in these four glasses, so I won't know which one is which. And a control beer will be thrown into the mix as well, a beer that I consider all right from previous taste tests that is going to just make sure I'm not biased against America. I'm going to be rating all of the beers out of 10 for uh, aroma, for flavour and for aftertaste and then at the end we'll reveal to me, you'll be able to see the whole way through what these beers are but I will find out at the end and we'll see what we've kind of learned from this, if anything. One. Let's start with what I'm expecting to get from these beers. I would have expected some head, clearly going to be disappointed there. Um, lots of these are going to be made with maize and with rice, so there might be some sweet corn character. They're going to be really incredibly light, not a lot of malt character, possibly quite dry. But I would still expect some nice sweet aromas. It's got to smell alluring, and that doesn't. It smells like really watered down synthetic lemonade. The tiniest hint of like honey or something, but it, it's tough to get anything out of that. No bitterness, no sweetness, bit of carb. It's just, I mean, it's perfectly bland. <laughs> um, aroma, not a lot of it, but it was fine. That's a, that's a four. Palette, again, fine. <sighs> just nothing to it, pretty close to water. Four. Aftertaste, there wasn't one. Um, depending on your perspective, that's either a good or a bad thing, but I'm going to say it's a bad thing, so we're going down a point. Tiny bit darker, tiny bit more honeyed, this one. Absolutely no head. So that's got a little bit of stale hop character to that. A little bit grassy. A little bit boozy. Mm, that smells a bit gnarly, that. Mm. And that has a bit of that postage stamp, like licking a postage stamp that uh, the Cronenberg 6064 had. Nowhere near as bad as that beer, which I now regard as the worst macro beer in the world. But it's there and it lingers on the tongue and it's, it's sticky and goopy and not great. So the aroma is, is bad. I mean, the palette was all right. No, uh, probably a three, not quite as nice as the first one. And then the aftertaste was terrible. Not a good beer, that one. Uh, right, this one, an entirely different colour to all of the others. Like a really rich amber caramel and digestive biscuit with it. A little bit of freshness, a little bit of hoppiness. Mm. Okay, a little bit cardboardy. No bitterness, no malt depth that I was hoping to get from the aroma. I thought that was going to be a little bit richer than it was. So aroma was 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 quite nice. I'm going to give that a, a six. 
The palette, again, it had a nice bite at the start, but not a lot else going on, so that's a five. And the aftertaste, probably a five, because there was one for the first time. Um, I mean, I can only suspect that that's the Yingling, because the Yingling is like an amber lager. I think it was originally a Vienna lager. Uh, right, this one. Yeah, I mean, that's got some, some honey and some biscuit. That's all right. Nice aroma, decent enough palette, nothing going on at the end. Well, that, that puts it in second place. Man, that's bleak. Okay, so far, so expected. Almost no character, almost no flavour, absolutely no bitterness, but incredibly clean and well made. Let's see what round two has for us. It's a bit more tea, that. Definite honey, sweetness, malt sweetness. It feels like it's going to be a stronger beer because it just smells a bit sweeter, a bit fuller. Wow, that's a totally different beer to the first four. Definite bitterness, definite malt depth and character. A little bit earthy, a little bit of postage stamp. I need to work out what that chemical is that sort of coats my tongue, and makes me feel like I'm, I'm sending a, a letter to my gran. Um, better. Wow, okay. Floral. That is floral. Berry, honey, lemon. If you'd handed that to me and said that that was a, a small batch light lager with some kind of interesting hop in there, I'd be like, yeah, okay. You know, that's really quite good. Um, it's got a lovely, <laughs> a really lovely fresh fall aroma. I've gone back in. That's never happened on a, on a bad macro taste test. It just lacks a bit of finish. So seven, that's the best aroma. Palette was as good as the last one. So that's a six. Aftertaste. It was better than the one before. It didn't have a flaw, it just lacked bitterness. A new leader. Right, number three. So we're back to the kind of weak lemonade. But this one feels richer, fuller. I'd imagine it's probably not a light beer, maybe a percentage stronger. Just a slightly bigger version of all the other macro beers you've, you've ever smelled. But it smells all right. There's something solventy about it, a little bit sickly sweet kind of thing. Okay, I expected loads more in the second half of that. There's, all, there's definitely no bitterness, a little bit of sweetness sticking around, but it just kind of dies on your tongue. Like, like quavers just disappear to nothing, but not in a pleasant, melty way. And number four, looks the same. Wow, smells caramelized. Smells like caramelized banana. Very cardboardy. That is like chewing on wet cardboard. Um, none of that sweetness carries through to the palate. That's. I feel like that might be like a beer that's brewed to an exceptionally high gravity and then watered way, 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 way back because it feels like it had loads of flavour and then got diluted to hell. Not very present. Bordering on rancid. Okay, so that last beer actually reminds me that we haven't talked ever on the channel, why would we, or indeed in these videos about how most of these beers are made. So whether they're a light lager or one of the strong ones, like a, well, like a bird, I guess, um, they're probably made in the same way, which is to brew a high gravity version up to seven or eight percent, because it's much more efficient with the grain, it's much more efficient with the energy, and it's much more efficient space-wise, because you brew a giant, very high gravity batch, ferment it all the way down, and then water it back just before packaging, which can kind of leave its mark on a beer. It can mean that there can be a lot of character that's sort of stripped back rather than just being a very clean and, and, and light beer. Um, the other thing to note is that these are not really lagers in the truest sense. A lager, lager comes from the word, uh, the German word for store, which means that basically it's fermented at a very cold temperature, around about 12-ish, 8 to 12, and then it's long conditioned very, very cold for a matter of weeks while it drops out, cleans up all the mess it made. None of these beers have undergone that. They've all gone through uh, an incredibly warm, incredibly intensive fermentation for just a matter of days, like three or four days, and then they're conditioned for a couple more days. Um, and it's all done under pressure and stuff to speed it all up. So that's why perhaps these aren't as good as some of the light lagers that are made by smaller producers. Uh, but they are incredibly consistent, incredibly clean. They just they just kind of lack that character of, of a true lager. So speaking of things that lack true character, let's see what this one has in store for us. Peas and banana, that's odd. And honey, that <laughs> not three words you want together and not three words that I'd associate with a light lager. 
the flavor of it is better actually. Um, and then the aftertaste well, it was much of a muchness, so I'm gonna go for a four. So I had very low expectations, then some high hopes, uh, and then as always, uh, when you're drinking, it all goes wrong at the end. Oh, sorry, I should just point out that's a very different color, isn't it? I forgot I've got two kind of Vienna-inspired beers in Yingli, Yingling uh, and Sam Adams. So definite amber color, much better head retention than anything we've seen. Smells of toast and rye. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. It's spicy kind of thing. So for the first time in this tasting, a proper whack of bitterness. Like surprisingly big and lingering powdery bitterness on the finish. So plenty of hops gone into that. Uh, there's a little bit of roasty kind of character as well. Like usually for this, to get that kind of color, you'd, you'd use like a Munich malt or something. It feels like they've gone a little bit heavier. So very, very different, much more bold than all the other beers and even the other amber beer. Very good, but actually, if anything, the bitterness is a little bit much for that style. Really lemony. Oh wait, no, no, wait, no. Scratch that. No, that's a sea aldehyde. So that is green apple, uh, green apple skin. Lovely in Duval and Belgian beers, not great in a lager. Yeah, I mean, that must be on purpose. They must be intending to do that to make it smell fresh. I mean, I don't hate that. Um, the sea aldehyde, like it cuts through, makes it feel kind of refreshing and light and fresh. It's got no character on the finish whatsoever, but unlike the other beers, which usually left something lingering, there is nothing going on on my palate right now. So it's almost kind of impressive that you can make something from malt, hops, and yeast, and it tastes of so little by the end. So uh, props to, to this blonde snob. Right. Next one. Okay, so that's a little bit, it's a little bit darker. Yeah, again, so there's a little bit of colour to that compared to... Uh, the other blonde ones that I've got here, so maybe a little bit more malt characters headed my way. Yeah, malty, caramelly, earthy. Smells like a British regional brewer's uh, attempt at a lager where they just can't quite let go of the, the British caramels. Um, and some kind of hot character there. Not lemony like most of these, but like kind of hedgerow-y. Smells all right. A little bit of cardboard on the palette, whether, I mean, I very much doubt his oxidation with these things, but, you know, just a kind of astringency that, that I don't really know where that comes from in macro beer, whether it's, you know, use of, overuse of, of, of hop extracts, whether it's making a beer just so clean, other things pop out to me, but. Okay, the final round. Will this deliver the knockout blow? That is <laughs> the palest beer I have ever seen. Um, that's almost water. Hello. Is there any aroma in that? Okay, we're gonna have to go for the covered sniff. So you can do this to trap the aroma as you get the essential oils out. If there are essential oils out of the beer, gonna knock out the car, but hey. Foam bananas. So that's another off flavor you get there. I say I'm acetate, foam bananas. That's all I got for all that effort. Doesn't smell great. That is the closest you can get to water that is alcohol. That is remarkable. I mean, a feat, a feat of engineering, but why would you want to engineer that? I mean, how do you score something that has nothing going on? Like seriously, like aroma. It ha it, the only bit of aroma was foam banana, so one. Uh, the palette, I mean, it was water. What would I give water out of 10 on the palette? One. The aftertaste, there wasn't one. There you go, most of its score is the fact that it didn't have an aftertaste. And the final beer. Right, has that got lots of color or is that just because uh, it's compared to that one? I mean, come on. Just, just, what is that? Kind of creamy, malty, caramelly, and a little bit of a sea aldehyde again as well though. A little bit of green apple. But hey, smells all right. That's that cardboard again. There must be something other than oxidation. There must be something that presents as cardboard, whether it's the hop extracts, whether it's 
you know, that, that watering down process that leaves something that is fine in a higher alcohol beer, but really comes out in a lighter beer. Just something a bit, eh. So there we go, the scores are in. Uh, there's a wild range from eight up to 19 is the top scorer. Uh, I can't wait to find out what that 19 is, and I'm kind of morbidly interested to know what the, what, what the eight was. Okay, so the results are in. I am seeing this pretty much for the first time. I saw it as I walked in, obviously. Uh, Bud Light at number one. Uh, this thing that I don't think I'd even heard of before it was mulled over. Thank you so much to our wonderful Patreons. Uh, names flashing up on the screen right now. Uh, you can join our Patreon if you want more of this. I don't know why you would. Let's look for the top scorer and the bottom scorer. So the top scorer was... Number six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cause Banquet. Is it weird? I was quite excited to try this, if I'm honest, and I never thought I would be. First, the can is super cool. I love the, the shape and the look of it. Um, and that was that was kind of kind of delicious. So I'm gonna pour myself some. Um, it must be very weird to hear a beer geek say that he was very excited to try these beers, particularly if you're American. Uh, the other one I was super excited to try was Miller High Life as well. You know, these are sort of beers that are talked about in American culture all the time, and within the beer geek community as well, they're seen as, as good lagers. So this was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Number nine. Yeah, didn't score that well. Middle of the pack. Roundly beaten by number ten. Then, oh, Sam Adams, okay. Um, and just about edged out by the next one. So this was my uh, stooge, I guess. So Beer and Moretti was snuck in there uh, by my faithful pourer. Uh, and it did all right. Let's, let's see how it did compared to how I scored it last time. So I've clearly been much more mean with these, which is why you day have this, because that helps us calibrate the other scores. I've clearly been cynical going into this, and I've knocked five points off of Bira Moretti, which is kind of mean. But hey, there we go. That, that means we can calculate this around. So actually, if we look at this, we'd, we'd probably assume that Cause Banquet, you know, would do extremely well within here. You know, it would... What was the, the winner was only 24. So yeah, of course Banquet's gonna fall just behind that probably. Let's now look for the lowest score. So that was number 14 with a score of eight. So the penultimate, Michelob Ultra, a superior light beer. Disagree. I mean, this one just had fuck all going on, really, if you'll excuse my American. Um, <laughs> I still can't get anything from it. I think this, this smelled of foam banana, didn't it? Yeah, and that's all it had going on. I mean, that is just... I mean, people debate about whether pastry beers are beer. Pastry beers are closer to beer than this. Let's see what else did pretty well. So we've got 17 for number five. Pabst, okay. So this, it's, it's a hipster beer. It had its moment again where it got cool. And actually that was all right. Drinking as they're supposed to be. Yeah, I mean, it's got a slight solventiness or something unusual to it but it's it's got flavor i think that's why i picked it out and, and quite enjoyed it um so american brewed pabst i'd i'd give it another go for sure any 16s 13 so okay okay cause light what is it is it the world's most refreshing beer that's what they say cold as the rockies depends on the time of year yeah i mean that is a pretty well-made light beer, to be fair to cause. Uh, were there any other? There's a bush light, isn't there? So that's uh, eight, scored a nine, actually. So that's the worst light beer. Worst light beer in America, everybody. Worst light beer in America. So what did I learn from this taste test that I didn't learn from the other macro ones? The first one is that there's quite a lot of variation in American macro brewing. And I'm saying macro brewing, obviously Sam Adams and um, Yingling, wherever you are, are considered craft. Um, jury's out on whether you, whether that's the case, but lots of variation from four to over five percent, lots of different flavors, some for the best, some definitely not. Uh, I've also learned that if I'm going to a barbecue uh, hosted by somebody I don't really like, Cause Light is going to be the beer of choice. That was the best light beer that I've tasted. Um, and I've also learned that this is not only a beautiful can and a great brand, it is quite a tasty beer. So. I'm going to go ahead and say that this, for me, is the American macro beer of choice, and I'll be searching that out if I'm desperate. 
it actually had character, it actually had structure. It was a pretty well-made beer, um, which is not easy to do at these kind of scales. So props to Coors. It's interesting, actually, two of my favorite beers have been Coors. So yeah, slight disappointment for Miller High Life. Uh, not the champagne of beer, more like the, uh, the Lambrini. Uh, but this is a delicious beer. I'd love to hear about your favorite beers, Americans, or if you've traveled in America, what your favorite macro beers were. A couple of these things we couldn't get hold of. Uh, things like Hams, which I hear is a brilliant uh, macro beer. Lone Star, which I've had, it's gnarly as fuck, um, when I went to Texas, so I don't need to try that. It would not have done particularly well. So all that's left to do is to say thank you for joining me into this Odyssey into water, sorry, beer, uh, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to check out the other macro tastings we've done, they're all up here, and I'm now going to kick back with a cause banquet. Cheers. Cheers.